Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with our Sunday Forum. We're happy to welcome back uh, Professor David Baines from Stanford University, who's going to give a related um, presentation to what he shared about last week as far as um, African-American churches here in Birmingham. And so uh, we're happy and pleased for him to be back with us again. If you didn't catch last week's um, first installment, you can find that on our St. Stephen's Birmingham YouTube channel under our Christian Formation playlist. And you can find this one again there later. So welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back with you. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to be uh, continuing to talk about uh, African American churches and Birmingham's religious landscape and uh, emphasis on landscape today. A couple years ago, uh, in honor of some of this related work, uh, one of my the uh, the geography department at my school has uh, the, this tradition. Only department does it, but every year they give an honorary geographer award for either people that help them or for people who are doing geography. And so I was very pleased to get the honorary geographer award. <laughs> it was the first award I'd gotten in a while. So, um, uh, so today we're going to talk about changing neighborhoods and landmark churches of the civil rights movement. So there's uh, basically three parts to what I want to say today. First, I want to talk about uh, churches moving around in Birmingham, um, and that's will probably uh, that's be the shortest part, I think. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about Woodlawn, uh, the neighborhood of Woodlawn, uh, where Grace Episcopal Church is. Some of you may have been there to volunteer or work on things there. Okay, you're pretty familiar with that. Well, uh, I think at least one or two of my students are there this morning. They'll be writing an essay on Grace, and, and students will be working on five other churches in Woodlawn, and so those should be coming out before the end of the year, hopefully before the end of November, on our website, Magic City Religion. Uh, and then I want to talk about other churches that are sort of off the beaten path that were really involved in the civil rights movement in Birmingham. And I'll be uh, building on a book by the Birmingham Historical Society to do that. So without further ado, let's launch in. Uh, so I'm going to lay the foundation with a little bit of demographic information. And this is not on the Birmingham metro area. This is on the city of Birmingham proper. So if we look at a population chart of the city of Birmingham according to the federal census, we see that Birmingham's population has declined steadily since 1960. So the city of Birmingham had the most people in it in 1960. And even though the, uh, some parts, little parts have been annexed into Birmingham there, uh, since then uh, the population has declined. Now that is largely a, uh, driven by what we all know and call in American religion and American history white flight. And so therefore we see that the population of African Americans in Birmingham as a percentage has stead steadily rose uh, become, uh, from about 40%, which was pretty steady for almost a century. Uh, from really from, if we extended that chart back to 1871 uh, when the city was founded, that was pretty steady until it uh, crossed uh, to an African American majority uh, city before 1980 and then continued to grow to over 70% in uh, the 2000 and 2010 census, although uh, while the population of Birmingham, I think, was basically steady in that time, the uh, percentage of African Americans has dropped a bit. So uh, if we think about what has that meant uh, for Birmingham's historic downtown, we spent a lot of time downtown last, uh, in last week's class. We uh, walked along 6th Avenue, as it were. And so downtown Birmingham, meaning the core part of downtown, north of the railroad track, south of the uh, Museum of Art, there are, as I count them, eight historic churches, four African-American and, and, and four uh, white majority churches. Uh, if we add in the white churches that were there, or synagogues, in 1950, we see that there were uh, considerably more. And then if we think about where did those churches that were downtown in, in one synagogue, Knesset Israel, uh, where did they move to? We see uh, that they all moved south. Uh, some southwest, some southeast. So to look at our laser pointer, uh, so first Christian here moved down to uh, Valleydale Road, uh, Pilgrim um, 
congregational church, moved to uh, just on the border of Mountain Brook, where it was the Blue Roof Church, some of you might remember, but that came down over a decade ago, and actually they moved back into Birmingham. Uh, But so the white churches moved over the mountain. Okay, not a surprise if you know Birmingham. Uh, If we put in the African-American churches that were there and are not now, there's just a few, uh, and we see they did not move over the mountain. Um, St. James here, which uh, basically had to go because of the interstate, it moved up to uh, just north of the convention center. Uh, The first to move was First uh, Christian, First Congregational rather, uh, which had a fire in uh, the 40s, I think, and moved out um, to Center Street. And then uh, this other church here by St. James has also moved, I think, into, um, into Smithfield. So different directions. Now, I was first drawn into thinking about uh, churches moving around in Birmingham uh, by this weird green line that crosses. This is a screenshot of a larger Google map that I can share, that I put together, that I can share with you. And three years ago, I was teaching a course uh, to senior religion students that was focusing on the Avondale neighborhood of Birmingham. And so uh, there's that crew of students at our end of the semester celebration. And so I was working with Lauren, who's the uh, tall woman in the back. And she was, uh, her paper that she was writing or focusing on, she chose, we define our neighborhoods when we do neighborhood studies by a one mile radius. And so this church, while technically in Kingston, uh, was within that one mile radius and she was interested in learning more about it. So this is Zion Star Apostolic Overcoming Holy Church of God. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the AOH Church of God. It's an Alabama-based denomination founded in Mobile. At times it's been headquartered here in Birmingham. It's a relatively small Pentecostal denomination. But we were trying to figure out where did this church come from and how did it get to be in Kingston. And so in doing that, um, it's now in a neighborhood that is... Um, as you can see, we used to be residential, but there's lots of empty lots here. There still are some houses. And of course, those empty lots all used to have houses on them, but they've been torn down as the city does when um, houses are abandoned, right on the verge of a more industrial area. So uh, we discovered that it used to be Southside AOH, which was down in what's now the UAB area. Uh, it was just south of the Bartow Arena. Uh, And so there were all these churches that were in this once African-American neighborhood that city planners, as after the hospital got going, they were very deliberate in saying, okay, we need to move this African-American neighborhood out because we're going to expand the medical area and and expand university. They were thinking more about just the hospital complex than a university at that point. But the rest of them moved to Titusville. The rest of them, as you can see, are moving southwest into Titusville. And in reflecting on that, I think that's largely an economic situation. And at the AOH Church of God um, was located on a mid-block site. That shows they were on a less expensive piece of real estate than a corner, right? Churches like to be on corners for multiple reasons. And certainly if we compare their building that they built in Kingston with uh, the largest, this isn't entirely fair because uh, Sixth Avenue Baptist Church was the largest Baptist church in Birmingham at that time, still maybe uh, African-American Baptist Church. But they have a much more impressive uh, building here on what's now Martin Luther King uh, Avenue than than, uh, Zion Star. So if we think about where churches moved in general, so this is more broadly central Birmingham as I define it, and so the purple lines show churches that moved out of central Birmingham, think south side and downtown, uh, that were white churches, white majority churches. Where did they move? They all moved over the mountain. Uh, and the green lines are uh, African American churches, and we see that they are broadly staying uh, north of the mountain in the city. Uh, go to a topographic map that actually shows you the mountain, although it brings in a lot of other advertisements, so I don't like that map as much. There are a few exceptions, uh, but they're largely early ones. So, uh, for example, the Christian Science Church moved from five points into Highland Park uh, in the 1950s and then uh, sort of in the white ethnic category, and that's an important distinction to make. Uh, St. Elias, for example, uh, moved from here over to their new building um, there uh, in um, Glen Iris. Okay, and of course this correlates with uh, current uh, geography of race in Birmingham. So this is 2010 data. 
And so this is census tracts, um, and the blue is at least 80% African American, and the red is at least 80% white. And just to orient you if you can't see it, so this is, this is the interstate, this is uh, Interstate 65, this is, this is 280 coming out this way. Um, yeah. Uh, and so you get that sense of Birmingham being a pretty uh, racially divided metropolitan area, uh, and that correlates a lot with economic division as well. So the, um, this darkest purple area, the average household income was more than 111,000 versus this orange area, uh, it was about 51,000. And again, this is 2010 data, I believe. All this is from the uh, website, uh, the ARDA, A-R-D-A website, American Religion Data Archive, which is a wonderful source and can do all this stuff. And is really built to help churches think about their own neighborhoods. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Jennifer McClure, uh, is really involved in that. Uh, so thearda.com, T-H-E-A-R-D-A.com. Okay, so to move on to Woodlawn. Um, so with that preface, let's focus on Woodlawn. So these are my students from this semester when we took a tour of Woodlawn uh, one afternoon um, earlier this semester. And so they are all, most of them right now this morning, I hope, at a church uh, in Woodlawn uh, researching it, getting to know folks. And they are going to turn in essays for me that I will, uh, drafts that will eventually appear on the website, and they're going to turn those in this week. So by the end of November, I should have them up, I hope. Um, but let's look at some of situations in Woodlawn. So what is Woodlawn? How many of you have been to Grace Episcopal or sort of familiar with Woodlawn? Okay, so maybe up to half of you. Um, so Woodlawn is this little area here. This is an 1887 map. So it was between Birmingham and East Lake. It's named for the Wood family. The Wood family st settled there way back in the 1810s when the valley first opened for, for white settlement. And their cemetery is right there. Um, just next to um, what the, the old church that Grace is remodeling for the Grace Works ministry. Um, so if we want to focus, I'm just going to focus on the African-American, historic African-American neighborhoods of Woodlawn today in the main. So there are three. Um, this is central Woodlawn. Uh, this map comes from a book I have Martha has over there, and the map's in it if you want to see it in person. So Central Woodlawn is really here. That Woodlawn label's a bit misplaced. Uh, so we got three African-American neighborhoods. We have Groveland. Uh, now, African-American neighborhoods are represented on this map by the dotted area. This is a 1998 map representing 1960. Um, and, of course, African in the 1920s, uh, Birmingham actually wrote where African Americans and white were whites were living into the zoning laws. Uh, they weren't enforced that strictly, but they wrote them in there. They, they mapped where people were, and then based on that, they, they did write it into the laws. For, um, and it was on, on the books for over 40 years. Um, so these are the neighborhoods. So Groveland up here. Uh, really two parts of Groveland divided by this uh, railroad uh, area, and the northern part is really more Groveland proper. The other part we might have called North Woodlawn, but I'm going to call them both Groveland this morning. South Woodlawn is here, and then the third African-American neighborhood is Oak Ridge Park. Uh, so to move from that map to another representation, I put this together for our study. So here I've sort of put three neighborhoods uh, that we're looking at on a uh, old 1920s map of Woodlawn. So this is my Greater Groveland area, this amoeba-shaped area at the top, and this is South Woodlawn here. Uh, this is Central Woodlawn where Grace is, um, and then this is East uh, or West Woodlawn. So to help orient you, there's where Grace Episcopal Church is. Uh, that building dates from 1924, but the church has been on that site uh, since the 1880s. Uh, Woodlawn High was just a couple blocks away. You may be familiar with that. And then um, the former 57th Street Christian Church, that's who built it, uh, that is now owned by uh, Grace Works or, or Grace Episcopal Church that um, I at least spent one morning helping to do demo at, and some of you may have worked on it more. So that's right there up the side street. Um, so, whoops, okay, yeah, sorry, I jumped ahead. Now you may be saying, sorry, 
this is going to set this upright. If you went to Woodlawn, maybe you take the interstate to get to Woodlawn, all the way there and get off that interchange. Well, where is the interstate? Of course, it wasn't there in 1920. So what did the interstate do to Woodlawn? It sacked Groveland. Um, so up here, you can see this was all the Groveland area. The airport was extended down into Groveland, and of course, I-59 and the interchange and I-20 and I-20 here. So Groveland is gone. Um, so let's go back in time and visit old Groveland. So there were five religious institutions in Groveland in 1960 that I know of. Uh, one was Groveland Baptist Church. That's the oldest one founded in, I believe, 1904. Um, and then the next one to come in, I believe, was Daniel Payne College, which was a college of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which moved here from Selma in 1922. And so uh, th that building was a 1950, a dormitory they built for women in the 1950s. That's the only photo I've found of Daniel Payne's old campus. Uh, Mount Olive Baptist Church dates also to 1922, and so it was outside of Groveland proper here on this side of the railroad tracks. I don't, th there was uh, Groveland Baptist. I don't know if you can see my little blue cute icons there. Uh, red, that's easier to see, uh, was Woodlawn Church of God, which was uh, operating by 1926 uh, or by 1925. And then the last religious institution that was present in the civil rights area, in the civil rights era to come in, was a Catholic mission, uh, Blessed Martin de Porres uh, Catholic Church, uh, which I believe was meeting in a house up there. So it was about there for about five years, started by a diocesan priest uh, before a religious order moved in to do the Catholic mission work with African Americans. Uh, and then it closed. Uh, but Af there were Catholic missions remained in the in broader neighborhood. Um, now, of these uh, five religious institutions, uh, the one I want to highlight is Mount Olive because its pastor, uh, Edwin M. Garner, was uh, really the organizer, uh, did a lot of the front work for the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This was the civil rights organization formed by African Americans uh, in 1956 after the NAACP had been outlawed in Alabama. And so it was formed at, at Sardis Baptist Church in Enon Ridge. Fred Shuttlesworth, for whom we've now named the airport, was the president, and we'll see his church later. And the vice president, uh, from 1956 to 1969 was this man. So he presided over the regular mass meetings uh, as sort of the master of ceremonies, presided over the business meetings, and his church was here in, in um, Woodlawn. Um, and so where did they go? When they moved out, uh, about 1970, roughly, is when the airport was expanded and the interstates were built in that area. So where did they go? Um, Groveland, uh, or okay, Blessed Martin de Porres had, had closed. Uh, Groveland Baptists uh, stayed in Woodlawn. They moved down here just to the border of, of Crestwood North. I think I have two students, Jackson and David, who are there this morning. They better be. Um, and then uh, Woodlawn Church of God moved over here, not far away, but technically into Kingston uh, neighborhood. Uh, they're right on what was... Um, get my avenue straight, I think 11th Avenue, it's Richard Arrington now. Um, and then, so they're there, uh, and Mount Olive uh, is that church with the steeple, and they move uh, right behind them there. And then Daniel Payne College, as you may know, moved seven miles west off of 78, but then shortly after, in 1977, there was a tornado that did extensive damage to the campus and the college never recovered. So that's when we lost one of our two historically uh, black accredited colleges in, in Birmingham, the other being Miles, uh, which is still going, which is CME as opposed to AME. So uh, to come back here to our, uh, yeah, okay, come back here to our map, let's think a moment about demographics here in Birmingham. So uh, here I've drawn a one mile radius uh, using ARDA from Grace Episcopal Church. And looking at demographics here in Woodlawn, we see it's pretty divided. So this orange area, which is again, was less than 51,000 um, in average household income, is most of the northern neighborhoods. The exceptions um, 
are south of First Avenue North, uh, particularly these three neighborhoods, which as you can see are in this middle category of up to 111. And that's what we call Crestwood North and Crestwood South in terms of modern neighborhood names. Now, Crest, the older part where Martha and I lived for 11 years, Crestwood North, was of course developed as Woodlawn Highlands. Uh, one of my friends grew up in um, the one house away or one block away from where we lived, and as he always says, the realtors had something to do with rebranding it from Woodlawn Highlands to Crestwood North. Uh, but it was Woodlawn, I, our house was built in 29, and when it was built, it was, um, it was Woodlawn. Uh, and you can see again the, the racial groups uh, follow that broadly. So we're going to next look at South Woodlawn, which is still a fairly intact neighborhood. And so those are uh, these uh, actually right here, this area here. Uh, predominantly African-American. Now I should say a lot of these inner city, as we want to use that term, African-American churches uh, are often, you know, it's, it's people who come from far away who have long been attached to the church who might run it, in addition to people who live in the neighborhood. So I really don't know, we haven't done that, but these churches are not necessarily, a lot of research has sustained this as a rule, they're not always sustained by neighborhood people, it's more legacy membership sometimes. So in South Woodlawn, there were a lot of small churches. Uh, this is a small area, you see all those blue dots. I'm just gonna introduce you to six of them. Um, so three of them that were not officially part of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights are shown up here now. The oldest, founded in 1887, uh, was Allen Chapel, is Allen Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. So it's still there. Um, Sometime after that, definitely by 1905 or so, um, Old Ship African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. These are two separate denominations that are very similar but have never gotten together. One was founded in Philadelphia, one was founded in New York, okay? AME is larger than AMEZ. Short story. Um, so they're both still there. And then in 1969, Woodlawn Deliverance Temple was founded, and they're in a property that had a number of other Pentecostal churches in it beforehand, including a, an AOH church. So they might have just switched denominations, I'm not sure. Uh, the three I want to focus on in more depth that are still standing in South Woodlawn were all, as you can see here, involved in the Alabama Christian Mo Movement for Human Rights. And if you go pedaling on your bicycle around Birmingham on Saturdays, as I do, um, then you quickly come across all these churches with this historical marker that they marked uh, in the late 1990s when they were doing this work as being churches that were affiliated with the uh, Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. It says mass meeting church. Not all of them hosted mass meetings because that was, took a certain size, but mass meetings, as we'll see, were held throughout the city. So the first of these we'll look at is the one that is still in its building that was standing in the 1950s and 60s. This is Metropolitan Community Church, founded in 1938. This building was built in 1948. Uh, the cornerstone, I don't know if you can read it, it says the People's Church, uh, and gives the name of their founding pastor, Reverend Hayden. And so this, this congregation is, is still there. Um, Jackson Street Baptist Church is the oldest church in the Woodlawn area. Uh, it dates its founding to 1869 when, Af when former slaves, former enslaved people, left through Hema Baptist Church, which still was in Eastlake and was the oldest Baptist Church in Birmingham, founded in 1819, long before, uh, actually shortly before Alabama became a state, long before Birmingham became a city. So as happened in many churches, uh, after the end of the Civil War, African Americans left the majority white churches they were a part of. Initially, they called their congregation Dry Branch. Um, in 1888, they formally organized, so there's a little bit of it's a little unclear, some of the history, so sometimes they claim this older founding date, always at least 1888. So this is their building that was standing in the uh, 50s and 60s, which I believe was built in 1904. There you can see a surviving cornerstone with that date. Um, that building was severely damaged in a 1994 storm, and so it was rebuilt on the same site, uh, and so it's still there uh, in uh, South Avondale. 
And this was a church that was actively involved in uh, the civil rights movement. And I expect with, with Garner being just across the um, highway, as it were, uh, he very much got most of the Baptist pastors in the greater neighborhood of all these churches involved, which is why we had uh, five so-called civil rights churches in Woodlawn. Now, in 1931, uh, the then pastor of Jackson Street uh, had a dispute with the church leadership and left and founded First Baptist Church of Woodlawn, which was obviously not the First Baptist Church in Woodlawn, but that doesn't always determine the name. Um, so, and so they built this building one block away from Jackson Street uh, and were ministering there and part of the civil rights movement until this building burned in 1987. Now, this gives us an opportunity to talk about how churches move and what one of my colleagues, Katie Day, in a book uh, calls, uh, called Faith on the Avenue, which is a study of churches in urban Philadelphia, um, she calls them hermit crabs. I'm not sure how I think about that name. But of course, a hermit crab is an animal that moves into somebody else's shell. So when a congregation moves into a historic building built by somebody else, Katie Day calls that hermit crabs. I call it adaptive reuse. Um, but anyway, so if we, so they moved into West Woodlawn Baptist Church. Now, West Woodlawn was a white majority church that was founded on the west part, west side of Woodlawn. And so they had built this building uh, after the Civil War. I'm sorry, after World War II. Sorry. After World War II, it was a big church at the time. Uh, in the 50s, big neighborhood church. They had two large education buildings, but by 1987, with that white flight from the area and huge neighborhood change, it had declined. And so then when... Um, First Baptist of Woodlawn uh, needed a church home, and West Woodlawn was to close, as has happened so often in Birmingham. The church stayed Baptist, but moved uh, to a different congregation. Now, so that's where uh, First Baptist met until 2018, when they sold their building, uh, first to the Woodlawn uh, Foundation. I don't know if they still own it or if they've now sold it to I3 Academy, which was developed there. So this building was now developed into a school. Um, before I show you pictures of that, let me just say that First Baptist of Woodlawn is still an ongoing congregation. They have land on First Avenue North where they intend to build, but they're now meeting with another Baptist church and have been since um, 18. So I don't know what their story is. Uh, in terms of what's going to happen. So my colleague, Jean Kildy, who I talked about briefly last time, she has an essay entitled The Serial Lives of Church Buildings, talking about adaptive reuse. And so here you can see, uh, this is from the front side of what's now the I3 Academy, a charter school, and then they put a parking lot in on the back side. So this is the old church building, which they essentially gutted and put this big glass in at the back end and closed off the front, but it's still serving the community uh, as a uh, community center, in this case, as a um, school. Okay, so that's uh, Woodlawn, and churches in Woodlawn, white churches moved out, you see most of them, except for uh, First Methodist, I mean, Woodlawn Methodist and Grace Episcopal, they were the two that stayed. I uh, might think, do I have time? Mm, very briefly, why did they stay? And the others left, right? Because uh, the Christians left, the Presbyterians left, both around 1970, uh, the Baptists left in, in 1994. All through uh, Birmingham, we often find that in the major neighborhoods, East Lake, Avondale, uh, Woodlawn, the United Methodist churches have stayed. Why is that? Well, number one, uh, for every Methodist church that's still open in that area, there are about two smaller ones that close because there were just so many Methodist churches. It's also Methodists have a connectional structure like Episcopalians, indeed Methodist clergy, uh, don't get to, the bishop tells them where they're going to go and be pastor, and the, and the congregation doesn't have to call them. So that has some uh, effect. Um, so those are among the factors, and maybe a greater com commitment to neighborhood ministry, why Woodlawn Methodist is still open. Uh, Grace Episcopal Church was uh, almost the only uh, Episcopal church that survived in East Birmingham. There was one around the turn of the 
century in the early 1900s in Avondale, Christ, but it had closed by 1920. There was one Good Shepherd in Eastlake, but it never got very big, and it closed by about the 1970s. So, so Grace uh, was able to hold on there. Um, now, African-American churches moved into Woodlawn as well as out of Woodlawn. That's the story with the Black Arrows. So with that, let me turn to the third part of, and last part of uh, my story today. Those are the student essays you can look for later, but let me just move on in the interest of time. And that is to think about landmark churches beyond uh, Birmingham, landmark civil rights churches beyond downtown Birmingham. And this all comes from uh, A Walk to Freedom, which I have a copy of this 1998 Birmingham Historical Society uh, book. Um, if you're not a member of the Birmingham Historical Society, I encourage you to do that. You, you get a free book every year because uh, they've basically been publishing a book a year. Uh, and so this was the 98 book. And it is also available online now, which is the way I was able to download clear images. So this is the map that Marjorie White and her team put together in that book showing where the churches were. Um, and this is my map of where they were or are. And very briefly, the darker circles are churches that are no longer on the same site. And where did they go to? Just to give you a sense, there's the red circles as to where they moved to. So you can see there were a bunch on South Side. There's none on South Side anymore um, because South Side is not residential at all anymore. It's UAB and the Lakeview District. Well, that's becoming more residential, but only recently. Uh, but I want to uh, conclude by talking about uh, churches that are on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, National Register exists uh, to recognize landmark properties of historic significance and um, protect them from the federal government uh, doing things to destroy them. Um, it, that's the only official protection it gets. There are federal laws that if it's on the register and federal money is going to be used, then you have to think twice before doing it. Localities can say, okay, if it's on the National Register, we're extending this special zoning status and review to it, though Birmingham hasn't. And so in the, to get on the National Register, it needs to be significant, which is usually defined in terms of architecture or in terms of historical events or both. So uh, Marjorie White and other people involved in Birmingham uh, history work in the, around the turn of this century worked to get as many on the register as they could, and they succeeded in getting about these 12 that both were still standing and um, had significant mass meetings or other events that took place in them. Now, uh, while all of those were only added around 2005, three of them are gone now. Uh, they've been torn down, often by their own owners, by the churches that still own them, because they wanted that property to build a new building. Because these buildings often, you know, they were old buildings and of various quality of construction and whatnot. So those three, I could talk about more, but they're gone. So let me talk about three that still remain. Whoops. So um, three landmarks off the beaten path. Uh, the first one that we'll go to is the most famous, which is Bethel Baptist Church in Collegeville. Uh, Collegeville was really the heart of the movement. You see it outlined there in uh, that purple up there north of downtown. It's a hard place to get to. Uh, because it's surrounded by railroad tracks. And more than once, when either on a car or a bicycle, and I'm trying to get into Collegeville, there's a train parked across the road that I want to get into. Uh, but it's a historic African-American community, and most famous for its largest church at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, Bethel Baptist, which was served by Fred Shuttlesworth uh, from the early 50s until 1962, when he moved to Cincinnati, but still remained very active in Birmingham. Um, part of the reason it's famous is because Shuttlesworth survived more than one bombing. So here you can see this white frame here, which uh, is a tribute to the former pastor's residence, which Shuttlesworth was in on Christmas 1956 in his bed when a bomb went off and did that to it. But he was, came out basically unharmed. Uh, and so that did a lot for both his sense of divine call, as Andrew Manis, who's written the biography on Shuttlesworth, can talk about, uh, does talk about, and for other people's sense of Shuttlesworth as a leader. 
This property is now a National Historic Landmark. We have two civil rights churches that are at this highest level, uh, this and 16th Street. And the uh, sanctuary itself, the old sanctuary, is well preserved. Now, one way that was able to happen is because Collegeville is had a lot of people move out. There's a lot of land available. And so the church, the congregation, was able to build a, a modern building in the 80s that's on the same block at the opposite block. And if you go there, there are um, these civil rights uh, march route markers, as they're called, that you may see around downtown that lead you on an interpretive history around the block. Um, and so this church is still uh, very active. Uh, its uh, pastor, Thomas Wilder, is uh, on the board of trustees of Stanford University and is a major uh, community leader. Uh, and if you want to learn about their worship during COVID, one of my students wrote for our website about that um, in spring of 2021. Uh, the next church I want to talk about is this one, uh, St. Luke's African Methodist Episcopal Zion, which is in East Birmingham. I love this church because it is so well sited now. There's this lovely park, Patton Park, that's across from it. And so you can see, uh, you know, it's just beautiful. And it's a really nice um, sort of Italianate kind of church. I uh, don't know who the architect is. I expect it was built in 1930. Um, I expect it's Rayfield plans, but those are not confirmed. Um, and so this made uh, the National Register, both because it's a well-preserved and, and dignified building, but uh, more importantly, because it's Pastor John Hart, who was pastor in the early 60s, supported the movement, uh, hosted many mass meetings, uh, and, and for that was rewarded, as it were, by... Um, racial terrorists by having the church bombed on January 16th, 1962. Uh, no one was in the church. It was a nighttime weekday uh, bombing. And so it still uh, remains on the National Register. Uh, the last church that I want to look to today is um, First Baptist of Kingston. And this is a congregation that uh, moved, uh, but their church was handed off to a different African-American congregation, Lighthouse Church Ministries, which still uses it. And this was another place, uh, a pastor who was supportive of the movement, George Dickerson, and hosted many mass meetings, including one, uh, most memorable one, on May 15th, 1961, right after the Freedom Riders uh, had been attacked in, in downtown Birmingham at the Trailways bus station, these interracial group that were working to exercise... Um, the Interstate Commerce Act, which prohibited segregation in interstate commerce, and then um, white supremacists who were um, objecting to this integration attacked them. And so there was a memorable meeting there at that time, but it hosted others. Now, this congregation moved down the street in uh, 2001, so here's the old church, and here's their new church, and they built a lovely new church, which is one level, uh, one story, not the awkward stairs, up-to-date, abundant parking, so we can see uh, why they moved. They are also, um, the other thing about uh, First Baptist Kingston, and I'll close with this, is that its neighborhood changed dramatically in the 1960s. It was surrounded by owner-occupied African-American homes in various states of upkeep. And so this was an area that was uh, targeted for what was commonly called slum clearance and to become a housing project, as happened in a lot of other neighborhoods, particularly North Avondale nearby. And as in North Avondale, while everything else was leveled and new standard housing uh, built, as you can see there from the satellite image, or um, in this shot, you can sort of see it from, this is a Google sh Street View shot, but there's the new um, red brick row um, apartments, houses, very nondescript that were built. Um, but this totally changes the nature of the neighborhood, right? Uh, builds standard up to certain standards of building, but also deprives people of home ownership uh, and dramatically changes the neighborhood. But First Baptist Kingston stayed there until 2000 and then moved just one block, I mean, just six blocks down the road, uh, and Lighthouse Christian Ministries is still 
uh, operating in that building, um, which is the simplest of the civil rights buildings that we've seen. So when you think about landmark churches of the civil rights movement, I'd encourage you to think away from just downtown and 16th Street, though it is the grandest piece of architecture, and uh, all those downtown churches played an important role in the demonstrations of 1963, but most of them were not really all that involved in the movement the previous seven years earlier. That was more led by these people like Shuttlesworth and um, Garner and other neighborhood pastors in African-American majority churches around Birmingham. Well, I best stop there. I'd love to take questions. I don't know how much time I've left myself, though. Well, we have only um, four minutes, uh, so, um, but people might uh, linger, those yes, who aren't I'm going to, to the next service. But uh, let me pass the mic. Maybe we can get one or two questions in before we have to uh, wrap up at least uh, the live stream. Thank you. I appreciated the uh, information today. Um, I have a question about the records of these churches. You know, what kind of condition are their records? Do they maintain them? Yeah. Um, you know, they're such a valuable source of information. And I wondered if, if your team has looked into that. Uh, no, we haven't. I, I haven't in detail. That That's the easy answer. I mean, I know that when... Um, the Birmingham Historical Society, Marjorie White and others were doing this work in the early 1990s, late 1990s, uh, mid 1990s, that they would have assessed that. And so a lot more of that information um, is recorded. And um, so it, it varies from what I've seen in, in the, the writing, but I'll, as much of this material as they have has been archived, uh, they can, has been archived either at the Public Library or at the Civil Rights Institute or if the Historical Society, but I don't think the Historical Society doesn't try to keep too much archival material because they're not cut out for that, I don't think. But yeah, that's a great question, but um, I don't know as much as I'd love to. Yes. Um, I'm just curious, did the churches themselves actually keep historical records, or was it just newspaper and oh, no, uh, some, that sort of uh, stuff? Some, some of the churches they do, like when they're uh, building these cases for um, the um, National Register status and whatnot, they're often appealing to church records and minutes that, you know, the church has calendar books and so can say, okay, we had uh, a host of the mass meeting on this night and a mass meeting on that night um, and, and those sorts of things, yeah. Yeah, though often these are, are, are small churches, uh, not all of their pastors would have been full-time. Many of them would have been bivocational. Yeah, yeah, great questions. Other questions? Yes, sir. Or which way? Is the Church of the Highlands active in any of these predominantly black neighborhoods? Yes, yeah. yes, uh, in Woodlawn. So one of the, um, I won't fiddle with it, but one of my uh, pairs of students is working on the Church of the Highlands Woodlawn campus. So. Um, so that's one place they're active. They, they refurbished the firehouse and made it the Dream Center, uh, the old historic firehouse, about 12, 13, well, more like 14 years ago. They were meeting, holding, uh, using Woodlawn High as a campus. Um, then they had to stop doing that. So they have now built a campus in Woodlawn on the site of the former Gibson School, uh, elementary school, which is just off of the interstate. Uh, so that's the one place in the historic African-American neighborhood in Birmingham where they, I know that they have built a new one. They were operating out of Parker High as well and um, out of the JCC, I think they might still be there, but there were disputes over um, that we don't have time for me to get into, but I can talk about later that led to them stopping to do that. But they have a strong presence in Woodlawn, yeah. Well, thank you all for coming out and asking some good questions. And if uh, you have a few other questions you'd like to ask uh, on the way out, uh, David can linger. So thank you very much for being with us. Yes, thank you very much.